Everyone dreams of living an uncommon life. And the best asset you have to achieve your dreams is you. Welcome to the Uncommon Wealth Podcast. We're going to introduce you to people who are living uncommonly. We're also going to give you some tools and strategies for building wealth and for pursuing an uncommon path that is uniquely right for you. Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of the Uncommon Wealth Podcast where I'm your host, Philip Ramsey. And I'm Aaron Kramer. Thanks for tuning in. As you know, we like to empower other people to uh, step into what they're passionate about. Do what they love to do. Yes. And every day you get to wake up and get challenged and you get to get, yeah, all the fields. Take your uncommon path. Yes. So take your uncommon path. That's what two advisors we are excited about. That's what our company is about. That's why we're called Uncommon Wealth Partners. And today we have Nick Darland yes. uh, with us, a fellow uncommoner, yeah. uh, business owner, and awesome entrepreneur himself. Uh, thank you for being here, Nick. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Um, so first off, tell us about your company, Home Revisions where you are at currently. That's what I want the listeners to hear. I don't feel like I do a good job because you and I talked before this and I know a little bit yeah. more. But we had a lot to unwrap here. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about Home Revisions. Uh, Home Revisions is a uh, construction company. We're based out of Ankeny. Uh, you know, we emphasize on historical custom craftsmanship, uh, really the nitty gritty of woodworking and, and bringing uh, what was once a uh, normal prominent uh, solution for people 150 years ago. We want to bring that back to life. Um, we do do custom homes. We built a custom lake house in Missouri. Uh, and then we do uh, kind of higher end custom remodels. We're really, we're really your, your Rolls Royce package of a company if, if, if you're looking for a service. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Love that. I like that. Something that I feel like we've kind of lost as a culture is like good quality stuff. Yeah. And you think about that when you go to get a new appliance and they're like, well, that'll probably last five years. And yeah. you're like, what? Like, yeah. How much is this? Like, and you're just going to last five years. Like, that's a problem. So I think what you're doing is super needed. Yeah. Tell us about how you got into. I that love this. Field. Yeah. So hold on. We got back up. Cause like, Oh, Aaron Kramer. Everyone. I know. So when I first heard about this, I'm like, this is so exciting. I got goosebumps because we were sitting in his living room and he's telling me about it. But first, um, when did you first get this idea that you wanted to be a business owner? Uh, so it happened when I was younger. I, I tried to start a company, uh, construction and it was just the worst experience of my life. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what an LLC was. I didn't know what, what insurance was. How old were you? Nick, how old are you now? You're not that old. Uh, I'm 28. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right. I, I, at that time I was maybe 21. You know, I had, okay. a, I had a, O three Honda Civic that yeah, you did. was just had a trunk full of tools and um, it ended miserably. Uh, my huh. six months into it, and I'm like, I don't know how to sell jobs. I don't know how to network. Uh, I was audited by the IRS because I didn't understand taxes. Why not? Yeah, yeah. and so I'm like, well, that maybe not right now, but down the road, I'll give it another shot. And wow. So, Okay, I, I now we're on this talk track. I feel like this is way different than what I wanted to talk about. But oh, my bad. That's okay. This is how I'm excited about that's this. That's okay. That's good. So, how do you feel like you got that entrepreneurial spirit? Like, is your parents entrepreneurial? No. Like, you just how did that happen? Um, how do you, I instill that in my kids? That's basically <laughs> my question. You know, to be completely honest with you, without going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole, it, I think it was just different scenarios in my life that I decided to step through. Uh, created the person who I am today. And, and I became that person of rather than sulking in my own chaos, uh, I want to go out and I want to make something great. And so that's, that's really how Home Revisions was born. Um, through failure. Through failure, yes. The phoenix yes. rising from the ashes. Yep. Okay. I know, because like now like, we got to like let the listeners know, like, okay, so you failed once. Yeah. But yeah. Let's talk about the second try. Yeah, the second try was, uh, it was more of me being stuck in my own chaos. Uh, I, I was really letting the the fear of failure from the first time uh, enable my decision-making skills. 21 years old first. Yep, then 23 second. the second time. Okay, all right, I got a question before that. Well, I want to hear that. It's yeah. important. But like, what did you do after you failed the first time? Uh, I was consumed by chaos. 
I my whole life was unraveled. It uh, it was really. I look back on it and I laugh because in the moment I'm like, How not can laughing. I get worse, yeah. Right. You know, um, I I was homeless. I was what? Uh, it was bad. It was really bad. You know, I was no even, job. You didn't have any job. No, no. I, I, I went back to a construction company. Pretty much all I've ever done was construction. Uh, but I had consumed so much debt. Yeah. I mean, I got to know collection agencies very well huh. to the point where I thought about applying at one because every time they call me, I would lip their, their saying, hi, this is so-and-so. No, uh, I'm calling on a recorded Nick. line. Uh, this is an attempt to collect a debt. And I'm like, you know, we've talked like five times. Can you just get to the part, to the money that I owe you, and we can come up with a payment plan? <laughs> right, right. And so... So 21, you just start going into debt because you're going to start a business. Um, or what happened? It's, it's a lot deeper than that. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the purposes of the podcast, uh, uh, we'll we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it's 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 much deeper than that, you know. I uh, I, I actually left home at seventeen. Um, I grew up in a very broken home, and uh, my senior year, I slept on some. By the grace of God, some family, I slept on their couch, and I deemed myself homeless. No. Um, yeah. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you go? Uh, you know, I growing up, I went to a small school called Twin Cedars outside of Bussey, Iowa. What? No idea. Usually, I have heard of it. Yeah. Nothing. And uh, uh, at seventeen, when I when I chose to leave home, uh, I ended up at Grinnell. So you know, I tell everybody that I'm from Grinnell. Really, I'm from uh, South of ninety two. Okay. The sticks, but uh, you know, Grinnell is my encompassing. That's the people that to this day I still talk to. That's right. That's my friend group. You know. Wow. So Nick. Yeah. This is fascinating. Okay, so like we don't have enough time in 45 minutes to unpack all yeah. this. <laughs> but I think it's just an interesting to at least hear a backstory. Because yeah. I think a lot of times, you know, we get somebody on the podcast and it's like, "Oh yeah." And we could have not got into that, but I think yeah. it's a part of who you are. You are oh, mentioned 100%. that. Oh, yeah. You know, I own my own chaos. That's right. You know, I and found so, my power in chaos. That's good. So. I'm glad I kind of dove into that. So 21 started business, didn't know what you're doing, but you had the Honda Civic and some tools. Let's rock. Yeah. 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 It was a five speed. Okay. It was a five speed. Okay. So. All right. Yeah. Says a lot. <laughs> All right. And then, and then that went away. Yeah. That didn't go well. And then you were just living off of credit cards and debt uh, until you're 23. Okay. Correct. Now we're there. Sorry. Yeah. And so that's good. I'm glad you unpacked that. I just learned a bunch more. <laughs> so yeah, I was uh, I was working for a small construction company out of uh, Waukee, and the owner uh, he's no longer with us, but his name is Mike, and he he would become a very good friend of mine. Um, he actually fired me uh, in the best way possible. You know he he knew what I was going through. He he saw my struggle, um, and unfortunately, with the size of his company. He just couldn't pay me enough money to mm. ever get out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it. We were working downtown off the south side, um, gutting out a, a home, and he walks in, and he goes, uh, Nick, I need to talk to you. Mm. So um, I take my tool belt off, and we go outside, and he's sitting on his tailgate, and he asked me to sit down, and he goes, I'm – I'm never going to be able to pay you what you're worth. It's wow. just, it's not the size of my company. I'm, I'm sorry. And he hands me a Pelicorp flyer. Yeah. And he Wait, says, What's a Pelicorp uh, flyer? Pella Corporation. Pella Windows? Yeah. Oh, okay. Pella Windows and yeah. Doors. Windows, yeah. He hands me a Pella, Pella Corporation, Pella Windows and Doors flyer that says that they're hiring. He says, uh, I know it's not what you want, but sometimes you have to make hard decisions to get to a better spot. So this is your two-week notice. I'm firing you. Uh, whether you apply or not is up to you, but... At least I gave you an option. Yeah. Right. And so... I care enough about you to yeah. like really give you yeah. one two weeks, and then yeah. another just to be like, hey, I've thought about this, and this is maybe a yeah. good fat path. And, uh, and so I, uh, I applied, and, and, and uh, I was hired. Uh, wow. I learned immediately that the factory life is not the life for me. <laughs> yeah. It's good to know though. Yeah. But it did put me into a position for the first time in my life where I'm like legit making money, you know. Right. I, it's so funny because I talk to kids nowadays that want a job and 
you can't hire a kid with zero experience for anything less than twenty dollars an hour. That's right. Where, and I can't believe I'm saying this because I know I'm young, but when I was back in my day, yeah, yeah right. You know, I we <laughs> I made twelve dollars at max fifteen. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's good money. Yeah, back then it was. For you. It's good for somebody who's not uh, consumed in chaos, but yeah. for me, you know, three hundred dollar paychecks a week was in and out. I I understood cash flow without understanding cash flow. Yeah, yeah. so school of hard knocks. Yeah, yeah. So. I tell my wife, I'm like, yeah, I graduated the top of my class. So, That's right. Um, huh? Yeah. Okay. So you got let go from Waukee. Right yep. now, um, the Waukee job. Thanks, Mike. And then you tried the <laughs> the factory job. That's not for my, that's not for you, Nick. And then and then what age is that? And then is this now when you jump into your second try? Yeah. So okay. um, I was at Pella for a year and a handful of months. So I would have been twenty one, going on twenty two in that time frame. And you know that conversation with Mike. It it enveloped a voice in my head of like, take this opportunity, go through the suck and get out of debt. Yeah. Right. Pay what, do what you need to do. So, um, and I did, I, you know, I, I remember I just wrote a book actually. And let's go. What's I, that called? It, it's called power and chaos. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a inspirational autobiography. Um, I'm working with uh Palmito publishing right now to, to uh, publish it it's in the editing phase so that's awesome yeah if anybody ever wants to learn more you that would know, be a good book can, it, yeah. it is you know that book was it was an emotional roller coaster for me but it was just such a release yeah probably know. therapeutic to unpack it it was it very it very much was um and so you know my time at pella i, I worked just the dumbest hours that anybody can ever think of i worked uh uh, three forty in the afternoon to two ten in the morning, um, and I just any chance of overtime I took it. The the factory shut down. No, I'm working, and every week, wow, all of my money would go to debt or or, or collections. Collections first. I I followed a little bit of the Dave Ramsey, yeah, you know, sure. snowball effect, and now I am where I am, and I'm like, you know, that advice is great for somebody who doesn't want to step into something larger. That's yeah, right. That's right. And so, uh, you know, it was funny because, but it, it it is like when you don't have, you don't even know which way's up. It's a good, yeah, something, yeah, yeah right? it's yep. something right. to follow. It's right. a foundation. Um, you know, and it, I met this this gentleman while I worked at uh, Pellicorp. His name was Jeff. He unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, you know, and, and he was uh, an older guy and almost fifty, uh, and he would spent a life being consumed in his own hmm. scenarios, right? Yeah, his own his chaos. own his own chaos. Um, and so we really connected quick uh, because broken people attract broken people. Um, and I one day we were sitting in his car. And, uh, at this time I, I couldn't afford anything but to pay bills and pay, pay for food to feed my dog. Mm. So, so I I would eat ramen noodles and I would crunch them up and I would put chicken flavoring in them and I, I wouldn't even warm them up or cook them because our lunch was only 30 minutes. Whoa. And, uh, eating dried ramen noodles. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Jeff, one day we're sitting and I'm, up eating my ramen and and he goes dude do you eat anything else and i was like why well, I, I can't afford anything right now you know and he he looks at me and he looks out his windshield and he goes man you're stronger than i'll ever be because i'd go to hardy's every night wow <laughs> so, that's actually really yeah. fascinating his observation yeah that's what i would do I'm like well that's discipline man like yeah yeah it was you know in the moment it sucked in the moment it was just like when is it going to end? And now I look back and I'm like, I wouldn't trade it. That's right. I wouldn't That's trade right. it for anything. The grind. Yeah. You know, like it. I, like I write in my, like I wrote in my book, you know, I wrote about my wife and my daughter and, and, and I, and I ended the chapter with, you know, I would go through all of that 10 times over all over again. If that meant that the outcome was them. Sure. Right. You know, the, uh, my daughter is, 
I her her name's Andy, and I had absolutely zero say in the first name <laughs> when we found out that it was going to be a girl. But my wife gave me the ability to give her the second her her middle name, and so I I I wanted it to be Grace. Sure. And the reason why is because she's the grace that God put in my life. Right. She's the she is the result of everything that I ever endured. Right. Dude, I love that because so. like with my daughter, it was the same thing. I didn't really get to pick the first name, but I got picked my daughter's the second name. Mm. Yeah. And I picked Faith, but Grace nice. is between Grace and Faith. Yeah. yeah. I, huh. I knew that immediately. We were sitting in Good the doctor's office, and I'm like, Grace. Yeah. This is why yeah. I love you. Wow. All right. So okay. So uh, 23 now. You 23. Jump into your second business. Let's go. Yeah. So you know, I I, I got back to a point of uh, at the time what I would have considered normalcy. You know, collections were dwindling, uh, accounts were paid, and now on time. And you know, I had a I had a Dodge Dart at the time. It was the first car I ever bought uh, with on my own utilizing credit. You know, thankfully I got it before everything fell apart. Right. Right. Shit. But <laughs> right. Um, we, uh, I had a 15% interest rate on that thing. What? Dang. Yeah, dude. Brr. And I'll never forget the first statement that I got. I really figured out quick what's principal and what's, what's capital. In- yeah. Especially at first, a lot <laughs> yeah. more interest than uh, principal. And I called my, my payment was $447 a month. And 320 interest. something of that went towards the interest. Yep. And uh, I called them and I'm like, you guys can come get this thing right now. And they're like, oh, you want to do a voluntary repo? And I'm like, well, I got like 11 collections accounts. Yeah. Like, What's well, one more, right? Right. But yeah. <laughs> then I'm like, I don't, then I don't have a car. So wow. I sucked it up. Right. Yeah. I right. really got to like that car too. When I traded it in for my 2020 Silverado, I was like, Man, we have so many memories. Oh, yeah. It's a yeah. good car. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, I ended up, I left Pella because I took a job back in, Ur- Ur- in Urbandale at this time. I-, I knew that I wanted to come back to Des Moines, mm-hmm. but my first go around in the Metro didn't work very well. So I also understood after talking to Mike that there are things that I need to do to get back to that point. Mm-hmm. And so an opportunity arose to be – uh, a maintenance supervisor at BH Management, which is a property management company in the metro. And that opportunity fell on me because when I worked for Mike, we did a lot of uh, apartment turnovers mm-hmm. for this company. And I got to know Monty Green, who is actually, to my knowledge, he's still a maintenance supervisor here in uh, Ankeny. So he calls me and he's like, hey, you know, there's this opportunity and I think you'd be a great fit. Um, and I applied and I got it and it opened a door for me to come back to Des Moines and kind of reestablish myself. Nice. So it was while I was working there that I was like, okay, well, I'm going to start another company and I'm going to do things on the side. And, uh, I, God, I say the name now and it's just so dumb because <laughs> again, I, there was no LLC or nothing. I still was learning life. Uh, but I called it Blue Ladder. Mm-hmm. Why not? Why not? <laughs> I don't great. know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just did little odd jobs here and there. And But I was very reserved and I was very, uh, you know, hey, Nick, you're you're getting out of your own self-induced chaos here. Mm-hmm. Like, right. let's just pump the brakes. Yeah, right. And uh, so it never went anywhere. Um, it was after other events uh and then meeting my wife that i decided to start home revisions Hmm. and so more chaos more consumption um but all of it led me to being right here today and so i'm thankful right okay so tell me how'd you meet your wife what's your wife's name my wife's name is taylor um yeah it's funny because i tell everybody that we met when i was in the midst of chaos I'm huge on chaos, by the way. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it, uh, our first date was at Buzzard Billy's. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I remember she ordered the chicken strips and I ordered the gumbo and mm. I'm just, I'm just 
deep throating this bowl of gumbo and talking about <laughs> inhaling like, this stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> J- just just inhaling this bowl of gumbo and you know in the midst of bites, I'm like, yeah, I want to do this and I want to travel the world and then blah 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 and and she looks at me and she goes, um, you know, I just kind of want a nice house in a small town with a white picket fence. Okay. And in that what? moment, I was like, I could give you that. Huh. And I did. There I did. Go. Aaron's been to my yeah. house. Yep. Uh, you know, like I write in my book, uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get the wraparound front porch, and nor do I want to deal with the fence and the weeds because I would go insane. <laughs> but uh, that's what marriage is. It's compromise, right? That's right. So, that's right. so how did you guys meet before your first date? Um, she was going to Iowa State, and, uh, well, it's in the book, so I'll just tell everybody. We met on Tinder. Okay. We matched on Tinder. Um, I used to tell everybody that, oh, we met at Starbucks, you know. Yeah, no. But no. it's so normalized like to just, meet people yeah, on like Tinder now yeah. that I'm just going to own it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Welcome to the show, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's so. cool. Okay, so home revisions, you start it. This time, you probably do an LLC, am I right? Yes. And yeah. You know, that. You know and, and, and this time, I when I start home revisions, it's funny because... I started home revisions when my life was the best it could have possibly been. Um, I ended up leaving BH and I'm working full time now for the military at Camp Dodge. Oh, okay. Um, basically, to give you guys and the listeners uh, the kind of an understanding, as my job role was uh, facilities maintenance, uh, working with civilian contractors on government work. I was basically the middleman hmm. between like. Jensen Builders and the military side. Yeah, it was a it was a great job, and not only that, it was active duty. So yeah, I was going to say that's actually a. So I mean, I twenty twenty three now, and I'm like, I'm making two thousand dollars every two weeks, and seven to eight hundred of that is tax free because of BAH that's and right. substance allowance, right? And, I'm like, man, I'm never leaving. This is it. Yeah. This is I it. I made it. Nick has figured it out. Yeah. Well, I did. Controlled and I, chaos. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, at this point, I'm just not happy because everything is the same. Everything is mundane and monotonous. And, you know, you, you'd think I was crazy because I left a job of, $75,000 a year and any time off that I wanted, I could go to the gym because PT is really big yeah. in the military to I'm going to start a company and I'm going to completely restart. And, uh, how, was, how does how Taylor feel about that? Well, it was actually her idea. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. We were at, uh, it, you know, like I write my book, I, I explain it. You know, we were in Home Depot and, and she told me, she was like, you know, I, I could see that you're just not engaged. Like, it's not who you are. Right. You're not meant to work for somebody, and I see that. Huh. And um, she was like, I want you to start a company, and if it's easier for you than when you start it, you know, I'll take care of everything. I'll pay the bills. Uh, and she did. Wow. The first year I had home revisions, I didn't pay myself a dime. Wow. I just had this mentality of I'm going to pour as much back into the company as I can. Um and I learned also that it is hard to live on a teacher's salary. Yes, it is. Amen. Huh. High five. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was. But it, it was, can be done. It, it can, can be done. Right. It can. And the sacrifice is worth it. Yes. If, Absolutely. If, right? That's the huge thing. Absolutely. I just think there's a lot of people who start businesses. One, this has been an overarching theme of the show is like how supportive their spouse has been. Yeah, always. Yeah, like that's been so. First, if you're a listener and you're like, I want to try something, and your spouse is not there, just don't. Yeah, just don't do dismiss. It. <laughs> try it again. But uh, for the people who do have their spouse's support, it's been a huge encouragement because of just sometimes it's the consistency of cash flow. Yeah, but also just think about what if you had to take money out of home revisions that first year? Like you would see how a business would fail pretty quick. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll never forget. And and I want people to understand that yes, the support was always there, but keep in mind that the support will be up and down. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it, there were many a times where Taylor was very discouraged, and I'll never forget the time. Um, you know, it was maybe six months going into me doing it full time. Uh, the one employee that I had was just going back to college, so I found myself doing all the jobs by myself, which is fine, not a big mm-hmm. deal. Uh, but when you're slow on your job efficiency, you slow down your cash flow. 
Yep. And cash is king when it comes to business. Um, you know, that's the greatest advice I think I ever got in the beginning is don't worry about your profits. Your profits will come. Keep your cash flow consistent because if you don't have money to pay your bills, then you're screwed. Yeah. Um, and there was one point in time where uh, my controller now, he was my contracted accountant. Um, he now works for me. Uh, he processed a tax payment and didn't realize that we didn't have any money. And so I remember I got off a ladder and I'm covered in dirt from working on this old Victorian. And I checked my bank account and it's negative $700, which you would think for me. Kind of normal. That's would, okay. We can figure this out. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know, right. like I told Taylor and she's like in meltdown mode. Right, and, right. She, and she was like, how are you so calm? And I'm like. Listen, seven hundred dollars. I've had my bank account <laughs> negative nineteen hundred dollars before, <laughs> yeah, so right. this is a this is good. Walk in a park, right? And uh, uh, I had to pay my employee for that week because mm-hmm. he still worked part time, and I had to take money out of Taylor and I's personal account, not only to satisfy the negative. Um, but account, then pay your but then pay the employee and you're already scratching <clears throat> it over on the other side <laughs> yeah and in that moment it was it was a moment of defeat for me uh mm-hmm. because at the end of the day like i'm fine living in chaos but i don't want my Taylor, wife to go through yeah, that right you know and so i it never again i was like never again this this will never happen again and uh you know it's just moments like that where you just got to keep going you got to keep pushing on and, and, and stepping up and showing up. Just yeah. show up. You know? One one next step. Yes. Yeah. One more day. Chop yep. wood, carry water. That's right. Yep. And Tell uh, me about your faith in this whole thing. Like from younger, like has that been a oh yeah overarching theme or like how does that, and, where did know, that step in? I didn't realize the faith until uh, after the chaos, right? Yeah, let's, can we hold up? That's a big, that's a big event. Yeah. The, um, yeah, you know, With that said in yeah. my in my book that I wrote, I I really attribute everything to like the grace of God, like the strength <laughs> that I had. It's funny because Aaron, you know, Aaron's my financial advisor, and uh, we had a meeting probably six months ago or so, and he goes, "Hey, do you believe in God?" And I'm like, you know, Aaron, uh, I'm at the point in my life where I really don't uh, much enjoy conversations that just end in speculation. Mm. You know. And he's like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, which uh, valid, honest response. Like, yeah. I get it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm I, I'm a I'm a very uh, I'm a critical thinker. I'm a calculated. Uh, I've, I'm very big on education. I'm going to Harvard now. So okay. I, I'm attending Harvard Business School. Um, so just to give you a kind of a foundation of like, OK, this is this guy's mentality. He he wants facts and he wants to. An unreasonable doubt, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, the f- looking back now, I, I attribute everything to maybe not recognizing it in the moment, uh, but everything was that I've gone through, the strength that I had that I didn't realize that I had, uh, I definitely attribute that to, to God. Yeah, grace. To yeah, grace. grace. Yeah, it's grace. Yeah. That's cool. That's so. awesome. It's like, when we're, like oh, we're on this track, so we just got to finish it quick. So how, how did you come to that conclusion? Because I love this story. Yeah, so, so I would say that you said after the chaos has happened. Yeah. And then you and Aaron didn't meet until like, like six months ago, if that, right? Like it hasn't uh, about been about a year ago. About okay. a year ago. Yeah. It took a little, yeah. yeah, so that, that conversation was a year ago. But as the listeners have heard, like you've been in chaos your whole <laughs> My life. life, yeah. And then just so a year ago, you were kind of like, listen, I don't get it. I don't get this faith thing. I, I can't put two and two together here. Yeah. And then, all right, there we go. Yeah, it's uh, December 18th. Uh, my general manager, uh, we were at a training event for another company that I now own, um, and he suffered a heart attack uh, out in the middle of a cornfield. Uh, he had 100% blockage in his front aorta, and he was, not to be too morbid here, but he was dead before he hit the ground. Yeah, you yeah. know, it, that's it was hundred percent blockage. Yeah, not when a lot works. <laughs> I, I was, I was from me to probably your stairway there. 
just eight, away ten from feet him. away. And yeah. by the time I got to him, he was on his side and just staring out into the field. Oh and my! If you've ever been involved in a scenario, I hope that you haven't. But if you have, uh, you can tell when somebody's gone immediately just by looking at their eyes. You know, it's just nobody's it's there. Yeah, it's what? a vessel. And um, wow, you know, and so I performed CPR on him for ten minutes almost until the, the emergency services got there. And, uh, you know, it was an hour and 13 minutes from the time that Nate dropped to the time that he was at the hospital uh, in quality care. So to think about that, that's a long time. Oh, yeah. man. We had the American Heart Association, co- Association come to our uh, office two days ago because they want us to come and speak at their heart walk. And, uh, you know, even the Kaylee, the, the lady that came and met with us, she was like, wow, an hour and 13 minutes is a long time. Let's, cause I'm going to ask the question that the listeners are probably thinking right now. When's the last time you like refreshed on your CPR? Uh, basic training. Okay. So how long yeah. ago was that before you ended about up about 12 years ago? Okay. Yep. Yeah. I, I feel yeah. the same way. So I, I'd only say that because, you know, a lot of times you're like, you get in this moment and you're like, I don't, wouldn't know what to do here. But like, y- there is something that kicks in like, well, you got to do something. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you get into uh, a critical moment like that, there's fight, flight or freeze. Right. And mm-hmm. luckily I've always fought. fought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, when, and it wasn't just me, by the way, there were other people there that played a critical role. Uh, Matt, did CPR first while Reese and AJ and I were on the phone with uh, 911. Sure. Reese was doing breaths. Um, AJ was Compressions. coordinating the, the, the location and everything. I mean, everybody wow. played a critical role. Wow. You know, it just, that's cool. When Matt was tired, cause CPR is a violent, Oh, it's violent event. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's taxing. Yeah. Like, you, you told me that you broke all of his, yes. his and yeah, that's yeah. all I was focused on is that's the only thing I could remember from my CLS training was if you're breaking the ribs, you're doing it right. And you're going about a two inch compression, you're doing it right. Yeah. Right? And so I just would count out loud. I, I said, there's rib number one. And Reese was like, just keep going. And you know, oh, wow. Um, but yeah, he, Nate, this week was his first week back. Uh, and he's, he's doing good, you know, he's, what? Okay. So, yeah. so hour and 13 minutes, he gets to the hospital yep. and then they, they revive him. He's uh, back. so they lost him. So by us doing CPR and then they brought the Lucas device out when he was in the field, it's a CPR machine. Okay. And I told Nate, I was like, dude, if you think I broke your ribs, that thing finished you off. Oh, <laughs> like that thing was, that was in the back of your yeah, spine, bro. Yeah. And, wow. uh, and so it was funny because when we got to the hospital, uh, they couldn't, they never discredited that it was a heart attack, but his heart was pumping and they couldn't find a blockage. They did EKG. Shut up. No joke. It took a nuclear heart scan for them to find that he had a hundred percent blockage in his front aorta. And within like 20 minutes, this entire cardiology team is consulting us like, Hey, we have to do an angiogram right now. If yeah. we don't, he's not yeah. going to make it. Right. And so, you know, I can't explain it the way that they explained it, but basically after the, the angiogram, they put a stint in and the, the cardiologist comes in that performed the surgery and he goes, he says, my pick line was 14 thousandths of an inch thick, which is thinner than a human hair. And I couldn't push through it. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and so the the angiogram was successful. Nate got a stint. He's up in ICU in the cardiology room uh, under treatment. Well, then we start getting consulting on brain damage. Yeah, right. Because it was such a long time. Hour and 13 yeah, minutes. Yeah, real quick, though, before you get into the brain damage, because like, you about said it, like they lost him. Like, they, they brought him back in the field. Yeah. And then they lost him again in the helicopter. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so, Jeez. you know, he flatlined twice. Technically. Yep. Um, and so once once all that was done, you know, okay, hey, we're out of the woods on the heart attack. We'll put a stint in. That's going to last forever. Brain. Uh, let's start talking about Nate when he wakes up. Because medically speaking, his brain went a long time without oxygen, and it's mm-hmm. very, very likely that he will not be the same Nate he was. 
And uh, so that was Monday. Everything happened on a Monday. This was Tuesday morning. They, I get a phone call from his brother. Hey, they're going to take Nate off the meds. They're going to wake him up. They're going to see kind of what's going on. And uh, so we're all there. And uh, they take Nate off the meds. He starts to come to. And he wakes up. And uh, his brother hands him a pen and paper. Because the doctors want to see yep. how you're going to react. They, right. Are you angry? They right. want you to be in kind of a fight mode. Yeah, they want right? to push him. Yes. Right. And so when Nate wakes up, he's aggressive, all good signs. Uh, he calms down, and then they, they give him a pen and paper, and Nate writes, what happened? Wow. And the doctors are in there, and they just are floored. They're like, yeah, uh, miracle. And the doctor's like, we actually have a video of it. The doctor's like, do you know your name? And Nate goes, yeah. He shakes his head, and he says, do you know what day it is? And he and the doctor nope. looks, leans into him, and he goes, you died. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, his brother uh, shows him a picture of the helicopter landing on the helipad. Oh, my goodness. And, and Nate just writes on the paper, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So Holy cow. So, yeah, he, he spent... Uh, he spent. He was out of the hospital that Thursday or Friday. I don't remember exactly. Unbelievable. Um, he has thirty-two weeks of cardiac rehab three times a week. Um, but he's he's back. He's he's back. This week was his first week back. And Jeez. Okay. So what did that do to your faith? There were. I get the right. best phone call. This I love this. Yeah. So I, you know. Because you two had the conversation, you're like, listen, I don't, this isn't, I don't really like to have these conversations because yeah. it always ends in like, well, you have to have faith. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It, uh, you know, I did, I didn't write about Nate in my book, um, for a multitude of reasons, but, um, uh, you know, I, I called Aaron and, and I'm like, you know, I was thinking a lot about our conversation lately, uh, and when we were at main street and you asked me if I believed in God and he's like, yeah, I was like, well, I'll tell you what, he exists. Ooh. I said, I, I, saw, I saw God work on December 18th. I said, there are things going on within time and space and outside of time and space that we just cannot comprehend. Unbelievable. It gives me because goosebumps. Because when, when, when Nate was laying in that cornfield dead, I mean, I, 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 I tell people I, he just had one tear. When we were doing CPR, just one single tear that came down. Unbelievable. You know, Real. And, and, and the fact that he went so long without oxygen to his brain and that he's fine. Right. You know, he's, he's functioning he's at Nate. all. Right. Yeah, yeah. He's Nate. Like Whoa. he's bitching about his ribs every day. <laughs> yeah. oh, did you have to break all of them? And I'm like, you sure did, buddy. I'll do it again. The machine did it mostly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and he's just, wow. It's a miracle. Nick, that is yeah. fascinating. How so, God used that specific thing. Yeah. A hundred percent, you know, and then as I'm writing my book, you know, I, I tell Aaron like, yeah, God exists. Yay. Um, you know, I start talking about all of my traumas from, from my early childhood throughout my childhood, my teenage years, my early adulthood. And I'm like, wow, there's a thing. God here. played a role in all of that, dude. Yeah. Wow. Like not even knowing it at the time until I wrote my book of like, my work was done through, through God. Yeah. And my work, it, it was my decision, but it was God's guidance. Yeah. And Gosh. I never realized that until Kiss me recently. Goosebumps. So, oh, that was, that was so that was best phone call I ever got. Yeah. Wow, it was very, uh, very impactful. So, <laughs> I just am like shaking my head. I'm super grateful for that, and like just the how God revealed Himself to you, but also the realization of going back. And there's a lot of times people can live through the chaos, yeah. and never put two and two together, yeah. right? And but you now know and see it very clear yeah. of what and how he's done it. And so, so tell us where, where you're at now. So Home Revisions, Taylor, Andy, what's the next phase for you? And Oh, man. Yeah. You know, I, I'm always doing something. You know, like I said, I, 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 I enrolled in the Harvard. I was accepted in the Harvard Business School, so I'm doing that online. Uh, started another company. And it's so funny because 
the thing that I get approached with by everybody is, oh, God, dude, do you think you're doing too much? Mm. You know, and I'm like, it's not fair for you to ask me that because it's not too much for me. That's it right. Might it might be, be for you. Yeah, it might right. be for you, but right. like, I'm living I my best life in yeah. adversity. Yeah. I strive in coming up with scenarios that are going to demand that I step into a greater version of myself. Mm. That's what I choose to do. Yeah. That's where my power is. And if Love you have it. a problem with that, then just keep it to yourself because I'm not going to change. Yeah. That's right. Right. So, but like, yeah. I want to like our listeners to know, cause we were talking about your chaos, the like, how many employees you have now? Uh, at home revisions full time. We have 10 and then and as a collective, we have 15. Yeah. Uh, we're going on year number four. August will be year four. Wow. Uh, I went full time into it. May of 29. No, May of 2020. Uh, it, it really came down to, I was doing side jobs. I had the LLC, I had the insurance. Uh, and the other thing is home revisions is a referral based company. Other than Facebook, I don't do any marketing. Yeah. I love um, it. We do the yeah. same. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it, uh, and it's evolved, right? Like in the beginning when it was just me doing office desks and, and office chairs and hanging pictures, just anything that I could do to create relationships and, and find work evolved into, uh, can you finish a basement? And then it evolved into, can you do, can you redo a kitchen? Can you lay carpet? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, but it, and then it, and then it just evolved from there from doing the small, uh, what I now consider handyman jobs to building a custom home. And my first home I ever built was in another state. And my yeah. wife was like, what are you thinking? And I'm like, if I can build a house in another state, I can I definitely can do it in Grinnell. <laughs> do it anywhere in Iowa. Yeah, that's right. And it was a logistical nightmare. Uh, you know, Harvard did a study uh, a couple years ago of there are two types of businesses in the world. There is a business that that stays with the status quo with what they know, and they base their uh, cash flow and profitability and workflow off that. Hmm. And then there's the business that is kind of the yes business, and then they figure it out as they go. Yeah. And I'm definitely the yes, the business. yes business, and then we're going to figure it out as we go. Yeah. Because. Not only the yes business, but also, like, I'm going to make sure that you're satisfied business. Absolutely. Right? Like, you know, even if it's something I've never done before, I'm going to make sure you're it, good. But Absolutely. it's like that yes business of breaking it down. It's like, I'm here to serve others. And if they're asking me to do this, if you want me to do it, I'm going to do it. But I'm not yeah. just going to do it. I'm going to do it well because I'm That's serving you. Good point. Yeah. You know, uh one of our company cores is protect and provide, mm. uh, protect homeowners from unlike unworkmanship, like craftsmanship, uh, but then also provide a premium quality service. Yeah. You know, I tell everybody and you can ask anybody in my company, we don't sell a job. We create a relationship with people, mm -hmm. uh, because that level of trust makes the, the sales pitch that much easier. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and the fortunate reality is in my industry anyway, is, uh, people have pretty much set the bar pretty low. And I learned that <laughs> pretty good and bad. Right? Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> if, if you just follow up with people, show up when you say you're going to show up and be empathetic about yeah. their concerns, because homeowners don't know. Yeah. Right? That's why they're talking to you. Right. And I've been in companies where a homeowner has an idea and then the project manager or the superintendent at that time is like, oh, you know, it's just the way they approach the response. It's, yep. it's they take it as aggressive and belittling. And so just being empathetic and saying, you know, hey, I hear your idea. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't work, but from an efficiency standpoint and a cost standpoint, it would be much better if we went this route. Mm -hmm. You know, it, right. it validates the homeowner and it makes them feel warm and fuzzy about what they had, but also doesn't make you look like an asshole. That's like right. you're a no at all. That's yeah. Right. right. So like, cause with that, company. like how home revisions do I want our listeners to know, like how you built this and that time from house just exploded with your mentality of how you serve others. You've been approached like, you got a TV show on you guys now. Yeah. Yeah, we have a TV show. Uh, you know, it's a quirky, dorky, little super low budget, but it's fun. Yeah, right. I enjoy it. Good. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, cool. we uh, from the evolution of the jobs comes the evolution of the cost, right? Like, my very first job that I ever did for Home Revisions was 1300 bucks. Mm. Yeah. 
when I went out full time into it. And, you know, I wrote about this in my book, actually, that that first homeowner, it was a garage, gable and rake uh, in Colfax. A tree fell over and broke it. And this guy was just crushed because no company would come help him. And if they did, they wanted like 10 grand because it was just so small and monotonous that it's not worth their time. Yeah. Right. And so when I went out and I was like, you know, I'll take care of you. And uh, when I finished, I'll never forget this day. We still have the tools. Uh, He pulls me into the garage and he goes, you know, you are going to be somebody. Wow. Yeah. I get, oh man, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. He's like, I, I want you to have this. And he had and a whole stall of his garage, brand new DeWalt tools. Shut up. Table saw, circ saw, my, I mean, different clamps. The basic starter package for a contractor. Any company, right. And he's like, you're going to be somebody. You're going to, I know it. I can see it. I want you to have all this. Wow. What That's a guy thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, to, to our latest client, uh, Jenny B, you know, I write about her in my book. She's such an impactful person, and and her job started as a front porch, right? Hmm. It started as, uh, hey, I want a front porch. Uh, nobody really wants to work on my house, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we can do that. We'll hmm. take care of you. To a $2 million uh, entire inside-and-out historical restoration. Wow. You know, it, That's uh, fascinating. It, there's Follow no job the too cards. small right? yeah because it always can it produces relationship yes which relationships are priceless absolutely yeah absolutely and you know that's uncommon and, and yeah and and the unfortunate thing is is we're doing her house it's big and it's beautiful and it's custom and then back in may she's diagnosed with als oh wow given less than two years to live no no joke oh uh, so as a company uh if you ever come to our 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 office and our conference room we have our wall of fame uh i'm really big on pictures and memories and we have uh jenny b's house that made the newspaper so we've got that and then uh as a company we banded together and did the als walk with jennifer that's cool um and then back in october jennifer has this piano that was a family heirloom in new york that she always wanted to bring back home but at the time, her house wouldn't be able to support it. I mean, this thing is a monster. Baby grand piano, beautiful piano. And so as a company, we orchestrated uh, a uh, trip, and That's we took her amazing. out to New York, and we brought her we brought her piano back. Brought her back. That's yeah. so awesome. cool. And That's it's, awesome. It's sitting in our, uh, in our front showroom right now. We're waiting for it to be prepped uh, to get moved into the house but that's great dude just, what a uh, cool thing yeah dude nick you're doing great things yeah. thank you for being on the show i love just the whole story and how it, it wove in there with faith but also your wife and the support and then all the other people that have been mentoring you so it's been encouraging to me i love it i yeah. love the story i was excited about this excited about you getting your story out there to help motivate others because yeah it's awesome this is one of my favorite podcasts great job yeah. nick Thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, you've been listening to Uncommon Wealth Podcast. I've been your host, Philip Ramsey. And I'm Aaron Kramer. Till next time, go be uncommon. That's all for this episode. Brought to you by Uncommon Wealth Partners. Be sure to visit uncommonwealth.com to learn more about our services. Don't miss an episode as we introduce you to inspiring people who are actively pursuing an uncommon life.